Welcome to Physics with Joe. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about free fall. I'm going to go through what free fall is, how is it defined, then I'll look at the equations of free fall, and then finally I'll do a sample problem to help illustrate a couple points about free fall that'll make doing problems just a little bit easier. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Since today's episode is all about free fall, I thought it might be fun to do today's video from the surface of the moon. Well, what is free fall? Simply put, free fall is one dimensional motion vertically where gravity is the only force acting on the object. There's no air resistance, there's no other force except for the force of gravity. And what we know is that if gravity is the only force acting on an object, all objects, regardless of their mass, their size, their density, will accelerate at the exact same rate. And that rate near the Earth's surface is 9.8 meters per second squared, and the acceleration points straight downward. So if we define up as positive, the acceleration due to gravity in free fall is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. What this means is if I throw a ball straight up, the velocity points upwards, but the acceleration points straight down, so the object speed is decreasing. And if gravity is the only force, the object speed will decrease by 9.8 meters per second every single second. On the other hand, if I have an object which is falling, now the velocity points straight down, the acceleration points straight down, the speed is increasing. And if gravity is the only force, the speed will increase by 9.8 meters per second every single second. So, free fall. One dimensional motion where gravity is the only force acting on the object. And if that is true, all objects regardless of mass or volume or density will accelerate at the same rate and near the Earth's surface, that rate is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, we're not used to experiencing free fall in everyday life because we live in a world with air resistance. So if I were to drop, let's say, a rock and a piece of paper, I would definitely not see them accelerate at the same rates because air resistance is affecting each of them. However, if I could create a vacuum and somehow remove all of the air and I dropped a rock and a piece of paper, I would see them fall at exactly the same rate because they're accelerating at negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Well, the moon does not have an atmosphere, so it's a perfect place to test out if objects really do fall at the same rate, regardless of mass or size. So let's take a quick look at a video from the Apollo 15 mission. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? <laughs> How about that? I love the fact that he seems genuinely surprised to see the feather and hammer fall at the exact same rate as predicted by the laws of physics. This is somebody who used these laws of physics to leave the Earth's surface and land on the moon. And yet, seeing objects accelerate at exactly the same rate, regardless of mass or size, is so counterintuitive to our everyday experience that even on the moon, He's genuinely surprised to see the result as predicted by the laws of physics. Go physics, yeah. Now, could we do this on the Earth's surface? Could we create a good enough vacuum? Could we remove enough air so that, let's say a bowling ball and a feather would fall at exactly the same rate? And the answer is yes. Let's take a quick look at a video from Brian Cox visiting the world's largest vacuum chamber. Now first, we're gonna see the feather 
and the bowling ball dropped where there is air. Then after that, they'll remove all of the air from this vacuum chamber and repeat the experiment, dropping the bowling ball and the feather without air resistance. Galileo's experiment was simple. He took a heavy object and a light one and dropped them at the same time to see which fell fastest. Now in this case, the feathers fell to the ground at a slower rate than the bowling ball because of air resistance. So in order to see the true nature of gravity, we have to remove the air. We are go for drop. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Cameras on. Two, one, release. came down exactly the same. Wow. Look, 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 look. Watch right there. Look at how they hit right there. <laughs> exactly. You're back on the side. Of the exactly the same. Oh. Feathers don't move. Nothing. Look at look that. that. That's just brilliant. Now that we've seen free fall in action, let's take a look at the equations of free fall. But first, let me quickly summarize the six different physical quantities that you'll see in any free fall problem. Those six quantities are initial position, why not? Final position, why? Initial velocity, v not y. Final velocity, v y. Acceleration, a y, which we know is negative 9.8 meters per second squared near the Earth's surface. And finally, elapsed time. The equations of free fall are exactly the same as the equations of constant acceleration in the y direction. The only difference is we know the acceleration is going to be negative 9.8 meters per second squared, even if you're not told it specifically in the problem. So the four equations of free fall are vy equals v naught y plus ay times delta t, y minus y naught equals v naught y delta t plus one half ay delta t squared. We have vy squared equals v naught y squared plus two ay y minus y naught. And last but not least, y minus y naught equals one half v naught y plus vy times delta t. Now some books give the equations of free fall slightly differently where they replace the acceleration in the y direction with negative g where g is the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. Personally, I don't like rewriting the equations. I like to have them the same as the equations of constant acceleration in the vertical direction, just that we know the acceleration in the y direction is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So you may see some textbooks that have equations in the form of vy equals v naught y minus g times delta t, y minus y naught equals v naught y delta t minus one half g times delta t squared and so on. Realize that these are exactly the same equation except they've replaced a y with negative g. Like I said personally, I like to keep the equations the same as they were before and just realize that we know the acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Now that we know what free fall is and we've seen the equations of free fall, Let's do an example problem to help illustrate a couple important points about objects in free fall. Before we do, let me just touch on two quick points. 
One, the acceleration of an object is only negative 9.8 meters per second squared when gravity is the only force acting on it. Which means if I throw an object straight up in the air, I cannot say the acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared when it's still in contact with my hand because my hand is exerting a force also. The only time I can say the acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared is when gravity is the only force acting on the object. Conversely, if I drop an object and I want to know what is its speed or velocity right before it hits the ground, I have to look at it the split second before the object hits the ground while gravity is still the only force acting on the object. Once it hits the ground, now the ground is also exerting a force on the object and I cannot say the acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Second point, oftentimes we want to know how long does it take an object to get to the highest point if it's thrown straight up or how high does it rise? The question is, how do you know when an object has reached the highest point? And the simple answer is, if I'm talking about one dimensional motion straight up in the air, an object reaches the highest point when its velocity is zero. So when the velocity in the y direction is zero, I know the object has reached its highest point. So I throw an object up, it's slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, stopping. Its velocity is zero for a split second, then it reverses direction and starts to fall back down. Quick question, when the velocity is zero at the highest point, what is the object's acceleration? A common misconception is that the acceleration when it's at its highest point is zero. But if the velocity is zero and the acceleration is zero, that means the object is not going to change its velocity. So if it's at rest and the acceleration is zero, the object would stay at rest. So if I threw an object straight up in the air at the highest point when its velocity is zero, if its acceleration was also zero, it would just hover there. It'd be pretty cool, but that's not what happens. Even at the highest point when the velocity is zero, the acceleration is still negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Well, let's take a look at this example problem. This example problem states the following. A ball is thrown straight upwards in the absence of air resistance with an initial speed of 29.4 meters per second. A. How long does it take to reach the highest point? B. How high does it rise? C. How long is it in the air for, assuming it's caught at the same height it was thrown at? And then D. What is the speed right before it's caught? Well, let's start with A. How long does it take to reach the highest point? Remember, what defines the highest point is when the velocity in the y direction is zero meters per second for a split second. Also keep in mind that we can define our origin to be wherever we want. In this case, I think the easiest thing to do is to define our origin as the height when the ball just leaves the hand. In that case, our initial position is zero meters. So let's start by identifying our known and unknown quantities. We know that the object was thrown straight upwards, the ball, at 29.4 meters per second. We know at the highest point, the velocity is zero meters per second for a split second. We know the acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. We are looking for how long it took to reach that highest point. We defined our initial position to be zero, and we also want to know how high does it rise. Well, starting with A, how long does it take to reach the highest point? We are looking for R delta T. Well, we know our initial velocity. We know our final velocity. We know the acceleration. I can use this very first equation, Vy equals V naught Y plus AYT, to figure out my elapsed time. How long did it take to reach the highest point? So we're gonna start with that equation, Vy equals V naught Y plus Ay times delta T. Personally, I like to plug in anything that's zero before I solve algebraically for the unknown quantity. So at the highest point, we know Vy is zero, so we get zero equals V naught Y plus Ay 
times delta t. I can now solve for my elapsed time delta t, and I get delta t equals negative v naught y over a y. I can then put in my known quantities. I have negative 29.4 meters per second divided by a negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And what I get is my delta t is three seconds. It takes three seconds to reach the highest point if the ball is thrown straight upwards at 29.4 meters per second. So now we know our elapsed time to get to the highest point is three seconds. Now what we wanna know is what is the highest point? How high did it rise? Well, now I have y naught. I'm looking for y. I've got v naught y. I've got v y. I have a y. And now I have delta t also. If you look, I could use this second equation y minus y naught equals v naught y delta t plus one half a y delta t squared. I could use this third equation, v y squared equals v naught y squared plus two a y y minus y naught. Or I could use this fourth equation, y minus y naught equals one half v naught y plus v y plus delta t. I could use any of three equations to figure out how high does it rise. Well, Let's actually use a couple equations so we can check our work. First, I will use y equals, or y minus y naught equals v naught y delta t plus one half a y times delta t squared. I defined my initial position to be zero, so this reduces to y equals v naught y times delta t plus one half a y times delta t squared. I can then put in my known quantities. My v naught y was 29.4 meters per second. My elapsed time, delta t, three seconds plus one half. My acceleration in the y direction, negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And my delta t again is three seconds. Do the math and what you're gonna get is my height when vy equals zero, which is at the highest point, is 44.1 meters. Well, let's check our work using another equation. In this case, let's use, scroll down a little bit, y minus y naught equals one half v naught y plus vy times delta t. I defined my initial position to be zero. My velocity at the highest point is zero. This equation reduces to y equals one half times v naught y times delta t. Now I can plug in my known values. My initial velocity was 29.4 meters per second. It took three seconds to get to the highest point. And what I get is 44.1 meters, just like before. Again, one of the nice things about these equations of constant acceleration or equations of free fall is often you can use one equation to double check your work. Well, let's look at part C and D. How long is it in the air for, assuming it's caught at the same height it was thrown at? And then what is the speed right before it is caught? Now, I set my conditions to be Vy equals zero meters per second, which means it ended up at the highest point when the velocity was zero. Well, for part C and D, I'm gonna do it a little bit different. So again, we have an object which is being thrown straight up in the air with an initial velocity of 29.4 meters per second it's gonna to rise to some highest point and then fall back down. If I wanna know how long is it in the air for, assuming it's caught at the same height it was thrown at, what that means is my initial position, again, I could define as zero meters, but if it's gonna end up at the same height it was thrown at, then that means my final position 
is also zero meters. So if I fill in my known and unknown quantities, my V naught Y is still 29.4 meters per second. My Y naught is zero meters. My final position is also zero meters. I don't know the velocity right before I catch it, and I don't know yet, delta T, how long it's in the air for. Well, if you look, what I have is my initial position, I have my final position, I have V naught Y, and I'm looking for delta T, and I also have my acceleration in the Y direction. If you look here, I've got Y naught, I've got Y, I've got V naught Y, I have AY, I'm looking for delta T. The equation that has everything I need is Y minus Y naught equals V naught Y delta T plus one half AY delta T squared. We're gonna use this to solve for what is the elapsed time delta T when Y equals Y naught, which equals zero. So basically when it returns to the exact same height it was thrown at. So starting with this equation, we have y minus y naught equals v naught y delta t plus one half a y times delta t squared. My initial position and my final position were both zero meters because I defined my origin to be the height at which the ball was released. So this equation reduces to zero equals v naught y times delta t plus one half times a y times delta t squared. Since we know that delta t is not zero, because obviously it's in the air for some amount of time, I can divide both sides of this equation by delta t, and what I get is zero equals v naught y plus one half a y times delta t, and if I solve for my elapsed time delta t, what I get is delta t equals negative two times v naught y divided by a y. And then if I put in my known values, what I get is delta t equals negative two times 29.4 meters per second divided by a negative 9.8 meters per second squared. What I get is my elapsed time from the moment I threw it to the moment I caught it at the same height ends up being equal to 6.0 seconds. Notice this is exactly twice the amount of time it takes to get to the highest points, to the highest point. And that is one of the key points to this problem is that if I catch a ball at the same height I threw it at, then the time it takes to get to the highest point will be half the total time in the air. Or said another way, the object will be in the air for twice as much time as it takes to get to the highest point, assuming I catch it at the same height I threw it at. Well, now I know that it's in the air for a total of six seconds, and now I wanna know what is the speed right before it hits the ground. Well, keep in mind these equations of constant acceleration or equations of free fall, what I'm actually solving for if I want Vy or V naught Y is the velocity. And speed is the magnitude of the velocity. So what we're gonna figure out is what is the velocity right before I catch it? So what is the velocity at six seconds, the split second before it touches my hand? And once I know the velocity, I can get the speed. So what we're gonna do is use Vy equals V naught Y plus Ay times delta T. And what we're looking for is, what is Vy? Well, in this case, I know my initial velocity was 29.4 meters per second. My acceleration, we know, is negative 9.8 meters per second squared and it's in the air for six seconds until I catch it at the same height it was thrown at. If you do the math, what you'll get is the velocity right before I catch it is negative 29.4 meters per second. 
the minus sign is indicating that the direction of motion is straight down. So the speed that I catch it at is going to be the magnitude of the velocity, which is going to be 29.4 meters per second. Key takeaway from this part of the problem is that if I throw an object straight up in the air, the speed at a given height is going to be the same. So if I throw it up at 29.4 meters per second, I'm also going to catch it at 29.4 meters per second, assuming I catch it at the same height I threw it at. Now the velocities will be different. On the way up, the velocity is positive. On the way down, the velocity is negative. But at a given height, the speed is going to be the same on the way up as it is on the way down, but the velocities will be opposite to each other because they're traveling in different directions. Three takeaways I hope you got from this example problem. Takeaway number one, if we want to know when an object reaches its highest point, that happens when the velocity in the y direction is zero meters per second for a split second as the object is changing directions from going straight up to going straight down. Even though the velocity in the y direction is zero meters per second, the acceleration is still negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Takeaway number two, if I catch an object at the same height it was thrown at, so that y equals y naught, then an object will be in the air for twice the amount of time it takes to get to the highest point. So the easiest way to figure out how long something's in the air for is to figure out how long it takes to get to the highest point, where vy equals zero meters per second, and then double it. Takeaway number three is that on the way up, and on the way down, an object will have the same speed at a given height. So if I throw an object straight up in the air, five meters above my hand, it's gonna have the same speed moving upwards as it does moving downwards. Now the velocities will be opposite because they're traveling in opposite directions, but the speed at a given height is the same on the way up as it is on the way down. Well, that is it for today. My name is Joe McCullough. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Physics with Joe. In my next video, I'm going to be talking about projectile motion. What is it and what are the key points you need to know to understand projectile motion? So until then, <laughs> that is it. <laughs>